Hello. Welcome to a special bonus episode of the Cinematologist podcast. I'm Neil, one half of the Cinematologists. This episode is a conversation between myself and director Toby Amies about his fantastic music film In the Court of the Crimson King, 50 Years of King Crimson, which is being released on streaming platforms everywhere following a successful festival and cinema release. Putting this out as a bonus uh, on the main feed so that we can spend a bit more time getting our next episode ready, which will be the penultimate one for the year before our sort of year-end roundup. And just really wanted to shine a bit of light on this film, which is a fantastic music film. And, a, and I think a really interesting conversation with the director, Toby, as a way of giving you a little bit of the cinematologist before Dario and myself are back talking to each other about movies for your delectation. Before I get into the main conversation with Toby, a couple of recommendations. Last week, I had the absolute privilege of being at the opening of the new John Acomfra film uh, series installation at the Box Gallery in Plymouth. And uh, it's called Arcadia, and it's a five-screen film, lasts about 50 minutes, and it's an absolutely stunning piece of work. Um, Deals with a lot of the themes that John Acomfra has been working with in the last decade or so around colonialism, voyage, um, the movement of people, time, memory, and kind of historical narratives, literally in terms of the the idea of a narrative and the construction of an identity and a history of a people uh, and of kind of events. It's a really powerful work. It's on in Plymouth uh, until June 2024, free entry, and uh, massively recommend if you're kind of on your travels in that part of the world, checking it out. It's a really, really beautiful piece, and I'll be going back to check it out. And I'll leave a link in the show notes. The other recommendation is for Apocalypse, a Bill Callahan tour film. This is a music film from 2014, and it's a kind of really poetic and enigmatic tour film following the musician Bill Callahan on an American tour around the release of his album Apocalypse. And it was directed by his now wife, uh, Hanley Banks. And it's a really beautiful film. It captures something of the kind of the beauty of touring and doesn't dwell too much on the kind of the mundanity. It's really kind of beautifully shot and sort of associatively put together and features some amazing live performance from Bill in kind of really small venues. It's a film that I've wanted to see for a long time. So I was grateful when the publicist for Ovid TV uh, reached out and said that they were putting it onto their service. I wasn't really aware of Ovid and uh, it seems like a little sort of mini movie uh, with an amazing sort of collection of music films, documentaries, indie works, art house films. It's yeah, it's it's a really interesting streaming platform, and I think I'm going to be spending a bit more time uh, sort of checking it out, uh, especially if they're showing films like this, which are sort of hard to see anywhere else in terms of being promoted on streaming platforms. They are it's available to rent, but doesn't really feature anywhere in terms of collections or anything like that. So it was nice to see Ovid spreading the word that this was on there. It's a really great film and. Bill Callahan's voice is the perfect voice for for Cold Winter Nights, I think. So check out the film and then check out his music as well and uh, check out Ovid TV. I didn't get to write about the the film in my book on music films, which comes out next year. I didn't really want to spend too much time on all of the the musicians that I loved and I just didn't see where it was necessarily going to fit thematically with what else was going on. So I kind of didn't, didn't see it for the writing of the book. Um, but I'm glad I've seen it now and it's definitely sort of something that I will be drawing attention to as and when I'm talking about the book, I think, even though it's not it's not in there. And that brings me to today's interview, which is about another film which isn't in the book, but for different reasons. Um, I was unable to write about um, Toby's film about C- King Crimson because it just came too late. Uh, he sent me an early cut of the film before it was at South by Southwest, which was really nice of him. And... It was just because it was released in 2022 in terms of festivals, it meant that I just couldn't write about it because my cutoff had to be uh, 2021 Um, because otherwise I just never would have uh, stopped writing uh, about films that were being released. Um, But it's been out in 2022 in uh, festivals and 2023 in cinemas and now it's available on streaming soon and it's an absolutely fantastic film. I'm not a King Crimson fan and you don't need to be. 
Um, it's a beautiful introduction to a kind of a long-standing band, but it's just yeah, it's just a really great portrait of a band at work, and particularly about the the kind of the the difficulties of maintaining um, sort of a long-term creative relationship uh, with sort of fellow human beings, which we get into in the conversation. But yeah, it's a, it's a really great film, and I'll put a link to it in the show notes. But for now. Please enjoy this bonus episode with myself and Toby Amys and myself and Dario will be back soon. It is the dream band viewed from outside. It's the band you could do anything you wanted to in it. Tell him he's talking a load of shite. This is the first King Crimson where there's not at least one member in the band that actively resents my presence, which is astonishing. You could trust a horse, you could trust a dog, but you could never trust a fucking guitar player. I love you, Robert. I'm sorry. I broke your heart. I'm sorry. That makes me living. Some of us went through hell. Do as you're told. I can't take this. At one point, I just walked out. When I came back from making some of that music, my hair had fallen out. I can put it. I don't have the problem. The problems lie elsewhere. The original lineup of King Crimson contained a bunch of c**ts, and chief amongst those c**ts was I can't be the only sane man in this asylum. Hello, Toby. Hi, Neil. How are you? I'm good. Um, I've just done a little intro, um, which says that I, yeah, I was kind of, I was saddened to not be able to include this film in my book about music films, um, purely on the release. Just, I had to, I had to have a cutoff point um, in mm. order to get it, in order to get it finished. Um, but I think that your film is, yeah, I would love to have written about it in the book in terms of just, I think it's a really... I think it's a brilliant entry into the music film canon and there are a lot of music films out now um but I think yours has particular heart and particular imagination a particular approach which I think is yeah is kind of rare um so it's 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 a real pleasure to have you on the podcast to to talk about it bless you thank you I don't know really where I don't know where to start really. I, I think I want to start with I think I want to start with the editing um I noticed that it was edited by Ollie Huddleston, um, who's worked a lot with Kim Long Giannotto, um, who I'm a big fan of. Um, and I think that a lot of the time with music films, there's a sense of not knowing what to include, how long to make things last, like, you know. But this film this film seems really cut um and you know, in a in terms of it, the structure seems really solid and you seem to have taken great care in terms of how the how the story unfolds. So I was wondering if you could sort of talk about your your, your work with Ollie and in the edit, really, to start with, in terms of how all of that material that you must have had took shape. Um, well, I suppose that you know, in a way, the most significant thing there is that the version of the film that you saw is the second version of the film. That there was another version of the film. Mm. Uh, that had the snappy title of Cosmic Fuck Prog Rock Pond Scum Set to Bum You Out, um, that had been made with another very talented editor, um, but it was made under a serious amount of pressure. Anything you do in the King Crimson space is done under a serious amount of pressure. Um, and it wasn't... It wasn't good, you know. It didn't get a good response. It didn't get a positive response. Yeah. Um, but it did allow me to say to Robert, who's at the centre of the film, you have to engage with the camera because most of the original version of the film was Robert running away from the camera and being crotchety and difficult to talk to, and it was a it was a an accurate representation of my experience working with Robert and King Crimson up until that point, but it wasn't a fun watch. So 
After yes. seeing that version of the film, Robert gave me a three-day interview session. Um, at the end of which, the day after that finished, my mother died. And and then lockdown started. So it was quite quite a lot to process at the same time. And yeah, as I began the process of recovery, I started to re-edit the original film with the original editor to try and include some of this material that I got from this very long interview with Robert. And it just wasn't really working. And the editor had some other commitments. So I was like, okay, well, we'll just stop there and I will, I'll find another editor. And Ollie was recommended to me via a producer who'd worked with him by the name of Rob Alexander. And we spoke on the phone and, and interestingly, Ollie said something to me, which I'd said to the manager of King Crimson when I started the project, which is, I am going to give everything to this, you know, is the, you know, Ollie wanted, Ollie said that to me and he also was like, is the material there? And I was like, yes, the material is definitely there. So we started re-editing it, but, you know, it was, that was kind of, if you like, sort of throwing good money after bad or whatever, it just didn't, didn't really work. So I said, let's, let's just start from the beginning. It's, you know, I want to see you, you know, your, your take on it. We don't, let's, let's not rely on the old film as the template. Yeah. So he started cutting it. I had as little input as I possibly could at that stage. I mean, that's something that I think that one of the sort of positive elements of the King Crimson methodology is that you find talented people and you let them get on. Yeah. You try not to give them too much and too many instructions because you'll miss something if you do that. And, and Ollie has, as you say, he's got this great background, um, working with some, you know, extremely significant, imported and important and talented filmmakers from the golden age of uh, British democracy, uh, uh, documentary. And so the only discussions we, we really had about content, I think initially were that we needed to focus on the sort of the primary themes of the film, which are time and death and the importance of of personal sacrifice in the creative process. Um, and we were both soon in agreement that, that Bill Rieflin was going to be the heart of the film and also the person who was going to unlock the humanity in King Crimson, um, which can on occasion be hard to find um, from the outside. So, um, and the other thing that's, that's great, well, there's, there are lots of things that are great about Ollie. Principally, there was his maturity, you know, he's a much more mature filmmaker than I am. He's been doing it for much longer and he's also worked with several different directors, whereas I've only really worked with one and he's a fucking pain in the ass. Um, talking about myself, obviously there. So, yeah, um, I think it was in, it was in polite. Oh, <laughs> Okay, oh, but uh, yeah, so Ollie, Ollie brought this tremendous experience um, and understanding and, and, you know, just technical skill to the whole thing. Um, but then the other thing that was really significant was that he's a musician. And and I, I love working with editors who are musicians, you know, because they just have this sense of, as Bill Rieflin says in the film, you know, it's my job in King Crimson to play the right thing at the right time. Yeah. And and with Ollie, he's got this uncanny ability to make the right cut at the right time, put the right shot in at the right time. And so it was an absolute delight. And and there is no way I could have made that film with anybody else, you know. Um so so much of it is is to do with with his approach and his uh considerable patience. <laughs> to show it the process. Um, 
so yeah i mean i mean i'm enormously grateful and i and i learned a tremendous amount and i think at the same time i think we had a a shared sensibility i think the thing that makes the film different if it is different to most music documentaries is that the film does not set out to tell the story of king crimson as you know taken from wikipedia or from sid smith's biography the film sets out to investigate the human condition using king crimson as the medium i think that's at its core that's why it's different to most music documentaries it has a different ambition yeah i i think that's really nicely put um you definitely feel that in the in the way that as the film moves on the members of the band become more comfortable with what the the film is going to do you know whether they were suspicious or just kind of like you know disinterested at the start there's a sense of oh, okay this is this is a space to do something very very specific you know in terms of sharing sharing who they are um which is i think if, you know there has to be a level of trust there you know it certainly feels like over the the process of the film the band grew to really trust you you know and it's a really nice a nice journey i think in terms of you know seeing that emerge across the across the duration of the film was that your experience of it uh yeah to a degree i mean initially it was it was pretty difficult um and i've used the analogy before but you know, I went to a minor public school, and when I walked into that very hierarchical, very male, very insecure environment, I was like, oh, <laughs> this feels really horribly familiar. Um, oh, and that's the sensation of being bullied again. Um, but that all said, personally, I would not want to have a documentary made about me. And I really would not want to have a documentary made about me by me. Yeah. Um, so, because, you know, it's my remit, it's my intention to to, to get to the heart of things as much as I possibly can, and get under the skin of things. But that said, because of that understanding, and also because I worked in the deeply cynical and exploitative medium of television, I come into those situations with a degree of sympathy and understanding of people who are, you know, having the camera pointed at them. And and I, <clears throat> my first film was executive produced by the documentary maker and teacher, uh, Daisy Asquith. And, and I remember on one of her films that she some of her subjects were quite vulnerable and she had built up a a supportive and functioning relationship with characters in her film outside mm. of the filming process and and i thought that was just very admirable um and and also increasingly i just think that's necessary you have to demonstrate you want people's trust you have mm. to demonstrate that 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 relationship doesn't exist only when the camera is rolling, you know. Yeah. It's so important. I mean, that's that's what I do in my films anyway, effectively, is I film the relationships I build up with my subjects. And then that on screen relationship and that subjectivity of the filming allows the audience to have a some sense of what it is to know that person. So you have to go in being willing to give as much of yourself as you're expecting somebody to give you, I think. And and the sort of the crazy principle I currently operate under and my feature length stop is that I don't ask people to sign release forms initially. Because I think it, if you are seeking to have a positive relationship with somebody you're going to have a much better relationship with them if you don't start it by asking them to sign a piece of paper that allows you to fuck them if you want in the edit, you know, and please excuse my language, but I think it's appropriate in that context. Um, and thank you. So, yeah, so the ethics of it are very important to me, and you've seen my first film, and you know that that 
a big part of that film is an exploration of the ethics of documentary making yeah. anyway. Um, so, so those relationships were important and I, and I did take time to, to, to build them up. Um, and I think also, I remember we were coming into Paris on the tour bus when I was on tour with them and, and I needed, you know, it's just me filming. It's me, a camera and, and a mic. I'm no, there's no sound man. I don't even have an assistant or anything. And, you know, I'm 56 now. When I was making that film, I was, you know, portly 53, um, not in great shape. And I remember sort of asking the bus driver to stop the bus about 150 yards before the hotel. And I jumped out of the bus and I got three shots, you know, of it coming in and, and people getting off the bus and stuff. And I, was, I was like, that's not bad coverage. I was quite pleased with that. But I remember the band being like, Ooh. you know, that they suddenly actually saw me doing what I do and doing it in quite a sort of, um, I hesitate to say professional, but accomplished way, if you like. Yeah, and yeah. and I remember had then, then I remember that, that, that there was a sense that, that I'd gone up a bit in their estimation because they'd actually seen me do something rather than just stand behind a camera yeah. and ask, you know, gently irritating questions. Um, so, yeah, so it was very important to build up that relationship and it was very important to make sure that the ethics of that relationship were were good. And it's slightly different with this film because ultimately it was the manager who asked, everybody to sign the release forms and he also signs the checks that said there's just the presumption that you know if people if people really didn't want to be in the film or they felt uncomfortable about anything that they'd said or seen then they had the option to say i'm not going to sign that yeah um and so that puts me under a crazy amount of pressure as the filmmaker simultaneously i think it's a really good pressure to have because you know it's my ambition to make a film that is true mm. and if the film feels true to me and my subjects even though they may not you know appreciate all of the contents but they still recognize that it's true then i think that's you know that's a very interesting work of art to me yeah yeah for sure that's my ambition lovely yeah and like they like say like they, they without with with that knowledge that they can do that comes the responsibility for them in terms of well you know they arguably have the opportunity to pay more attention to you and see what you're doing is serious and invested in those ways rather than you know which i think helps i think you know helps them let's like say see you as a as a film i'd like to kind of circle back to the the kind of the visibility of the the making of the film because i do think it's interesting in both the films but this might be a bit of a reach, but I was thinking about it in terms of your role in the film and the court idea and the idea of the court and the king made me think of you as a kind of jester character um, in the sense of kind of playing the fool. But on rewatching it, because I saw the film earlier, rewatching it, I was like, oh, he's he's playing that very sophisticated role of the jester, which is, you know, appearing foolish, but also provoking and pointing, you know, pointing out things or you know, the jester is often the character that alerts us to the deeper truths. You know, um, so I just wonder if you could, if that if if that rings true in any way, or if I'm just making a kind of ridiculous leap. But also, yeah, like, how did your how did that relationship shift in terms of like how you were able to how you were able to move the film in the emotional directions that you did? Um, you know, I, I, as it progressed, you know, beyond just they they just opened up because i think it's 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 usually more complicated than that you need to do more filmmaking um in order to make that happen i am preparing the longest sigh i possibly could <laughs> um it um it's been an absolute fucking nightmare neil if i'm honest i <clears throat> my um ah, yeah okay the career path that was chosen for me when I was growing up was to go to Oxford and do PPE and then go from Oxford into the diplomatic service of either the United Kingdom or Australia, because I'm half Australian technically. My grandfather was a diplomat. And 
I, you know, I sort of dismissed all that in order to, you know, sell my soul to rock and roll, or give my soul to rock and roll. Um, Just like Joe Strummer did. Uh, his dad was a diplomat. So. Hmm? Oh, really? Just like Joe Strummer did. His, da his dad was a diplomat. Yeah. He was born in Turkey. Yeah. Oh, right. But, yeah, so, but with it, these things are all about relationships. When it comes down to it, whether you know whether whether you're uh, dealing with Robert Fripp or Golda Meir, um, and um, so as a consequence, um, it is it is very similar. That setup is very similar to a royal. You know, in spite of Robert saying, I'm not the center of King Crimson, King Crimson is not me. He's only recently sort of admitted to being the leader of the band. Um, but effectively, it is, a, it is a royal court, of the, you know, and to sort of, to stretch the analogy, the musicians are the knights at the table, you know, and then the various people associated with it are the courtiers and so on, and... Um, I didn't initially think of myself as the jester because initially I didn't really think of myself as being part of the court. Increasingly, it's now been, I think, five years pretty much since the film was came into its inception. And, and I've had to admit that I am a member of the court um, or a member of the cult, if you prefer. Um, because I had to embed myself so deeply that it was inevitable that some of that stuff was going to, you know, rub off on me and that I wouldn't also get the access I needed unless I embedded myself that deeply. Somebody said to me the other day, it is only the jester or the priest who is allowed to tell the king that he is mad. There you go. There you go. Which... Uh, would be a good strap line for the film. Um, so, but which is, which is to say that it, that that I had to negotiate an incredibly complicated set of relationships, both in terms of my interactions with people in that environment, that institution, but also in terms of how I had to deal with the pre-existing relationships and also the historical relationships that had ended because people were dead or were too angry to, you know, to have anything to do with, with anything associated with King Crimson in, in the present. And um, if, you know, as the film sort of goes to some degree to demonstrate, there is a lot of bitterness um, <clears throat> associated with that band. And I think that a lot of that has to do with people having the sense that by being in this very, very stimulating and rewarding and exciting and free creative environment in which they get to do some of the best work of their lives, they also, subsequent to leaving the court, they have the sense that they've been sucked dry. And, and sucked dry in a way that actually ultimately was not of great benefit to them. Um, but that's the nature of hierarchical power structures, you know, is that they benefit the people at the top. They don't necessarily benefit mm. the people below. But they exist, and they're allowed to exist because the people below believe that they are of benefit to them. But, you know, that's the essence, isn't it, of... The society of the spectacle is that the spectacle exists there to hypnotize us into yeah. giving our labor to the bosses for a very low fee. Um, I'm not suggesting for a second that's happening in the court of the Crimson King, but I'm just saying that that's the hierarchical mm. nature of power. Um, so, so I wasn't there to no, the pit. Not but that's not what the jester does, is it? That's the thing. You know, I think I did, did have to... No. I did. I did have to to find a balance between getting material that was useful and true, um, and that required a certain amount of um, persistence on, on my behalf. Nevertheless, I had to be careful not to do it in such a way that I was denied yeah. access. Um, and 
again, my initial experience of making the film was that I was kind of basically denied access for the first six months of making it. You know, Robert wouldn't talk to me. Um, <clears throat> and, and I had to find a methodology that allowed me to demonstrate to him that you know, more was required if we were going to make a fulfilling film. Um, and I think, I think it was, I think it was difficult for everybody involved to recognize that, you know, once you become part of a documentary film, you're no longer really yourself. You, you, you're being turned into an archetype of one type or another, you know, even if the director has the best of intentions and I hope I had the best of intentions. That, that you're still reducing people um, by putting them on screen. You're, you're, you're demonstrating, hopefully, you know, you're revealing stuff about their character and their motivations and their feelings and so on. But, but nevertheless, they are being squeezed into these kind of archetypal roles as well. And I think that was something that was quite interesting about this film um, was that because there have been lots of bass players in King Crimson, it was always very interesting to me to see to what degree the experience of being in King Crimson, playing bass in King Crimson in the 80s and 90s and 2000s, like Tony Levin did, versus the experience of, of um, uh, you know, Greg Lake or, or um, you know, in terms of... Um, these different approaches and, and the degree to which it is it is the same um i'm just i'm just uh, yeah I'm, you know i i i still don't know that much in terms of chapter and verse um because i when i when i started doing my research into the film i just realized that there were so many different versions of the history that that not only is that quite boring to watch, you know, textual criticism or whatever, but it's also, you're not going to learn very much that's positive about the human spirit if you're just concentrating on old men going, no, 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 it didn't happen yeah, yeah. that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, think, I, think, I think we've learned enough about old, old men being bitter and disappointed now at this point, you know, to really, there's no, there's no need to, to introduce more into the canon in that area. Um, that's a very rambling answer to no, a question. Fine. Did you get what you needed? Yeah, no, yeah, of course, yeah. Um, yeah, no, it, 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 oh, and, and that stuff is elsewhere, isn't it? You know, and I think there are books, there are, you know, uncut and mojo special issues up the, up the wazoo. Yeah. Um, so I, th I thought it was really interesting, yeah, that, that the film presents a lot of the things which other music films try and hide in terms of tensions or romanticize you know and i think that it's an unsentimental film um but it's very moving in parts you know i think that obviously that bill's story but also that you know ian's kind of admission about leaving you know it feels very tr authentic and true in a way that doesn't feel like it's kind of part of this kind of redemption narrative. It feels like it's part of the project of, you know, the reality of this band and arguably any enterprise, artistic enterprise that can go in any form for 50 years is going to be complicated. And there's mm. going to be, there's going to be a trail of complicated feelings that have not been resolved, you know, and I love the mm. way the film doesn't try and resolve it, but brings to the surface those things which remind us that it's complicated um which feels very much like a modus operandi for you in terms of what you wanted the experience of the film to be yeah i think um i mean i'm i'm very wary of of having anything other than dynamic principles uh, in terms of how I approach filmmaking, I don't have rules, generally speaking. I guess I have one rule, which is that if you don't bring it, you'll need it. And if you bring it, you won't need it. Um, and the other one is the moment you notice the light, you've lost it. Um, as presuming you don't have a camera in your hand, but those are more practical yeah, yeah. things. But other than that, yeah, I try to be 
as adaptable as as possible. But that all said, I think that when 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 thinking about a film strategically in terms of the the sort of big picture, I do. I do like to think in terms of what do I want the audience to be thinking, feeling, and talking about when they leave the cinema. And and you're right, I don't want to tie everything up into some kind of, as you say, sort of simple redemption narrative. But I do, I do want people to leave the cinema having a conversation about a core dilemma that's at the heart of the film. Interesting. And and the interesting thing about the core dilemma is that it's not solvable. You know, it's something that you have to talk through and find an accommodation with. And I think that one of the things that struck me as a flagstone on the path to maturity is is the recognition that I've had that even if I make the if I'm faced with a choice, if I make the right decision, even if I make absolutely the right decision, there are going to be ne negative repercussions associated with it, and I have to balance those two things. And so, for me, with this film, I was aware that, as I said, the themes are to do with time and, and death, but the core dilemma, I think, is. What are we willing to sacrifice in order to bring something of beauty and meaning into the world, basically? You know, and that doesn't, it, you know, that could be Lark's Tongues and Aspect, or it could be a chocolate cake. Yeah. You know, that's a universal dilemma. And I thought that was interesting. And I think that it's, um, so, so, yeah, so, so, and, and that dilemma is, is, you know, acutely obvious in the King Crimson creative process. And it's something Robert speaks about ele very eloquently. Um, and, you know, and it was, it was also my experience. I mean, I, my films that hopefully are not about me. Hopefully I've managed to sort of channel my ego and id enough into the films that they allow for a subjective experience on the viewer. Um, for the viewer, but but it's not it's not about you know my my problems or my issues or whatever. Um, I'm just there to operate as a vessel for the audience, but or a channel for the audience. But um, that said, my experience of being in that creative environment is undoubtedly you know I've made a film I'm very proud of. It's a it's a work of art for me. You know that doesn't mean it's good or bad, but it's important to me that. For me, it's a it's a true work of art. Um, nevertheless, it was an absolute fucking nightmare to make, and it continues to be an absolute fucking nightmare to be associated with. And and my ultimate experience of the whole thing is like, was it worth it? Just, but only just. Um, and but then I think that's entirely appropriate, and I think that. You know, I said a long time ago that I'm not going to retain my sanity if I try and work out what's going on in Robert Fripp's head. That said, when he talks about the acute suffering of, you know, everything still being in potential but not, not yet being achieved, I, I, you know, that resonates with me very, very strongly. And I think a lot of that stuff, and particularly the a sense of dissatisfaction and disappointment and frustration with your own inability to, to bring into being the thing that you see in your head um, will resonate for, for anybody who's involved in any kind of creative process. Mm -hmm. Again, whether that's chocolate cake or sculpture or painting or, you know, a song. What I find interesting about what you're saying there is is how in the film... You are a vessel, but you, but but it's more than that. In the sense of you're helping the audience understand the film at the same time that they're watching it. You know, like you're you you said earlier. You know that the the process of making the film is very very much on the surface. You know, like you're not you're not the kind of the idea of Penny Baker in the corner with the camera and everything's just happening, you know, that, that you are 
acknowledging that you are an active participant in what's happening, but but not drawing attention, but drawing attention in a way which kind of does the same for your film that you're talking about there. Because I think of Bill's story and how you handle that and how you, you make it very, very plain on camera that, you know, you are aware that in terms of the film you're making, this story is a great asset, you know, because it's, 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 it's raw, beautiful, horribly painful. You know, it's a, it's a very real and sad thing, but the film is going to benefit from that exposure. And you talk through that in a way which does that really, that, the, you know, you are aware of the sacrifice of, of the decisions you're going to have to make and that you're making as you go. And I think you handle that really well, but it, I think it, it it, it 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 puts you in the film as the filmmaker, not as Toby, the the audience guide, but as the person who is trying to construct something beautiful out of these circumstances and this particular circumstance, which is, you know, you feel how difficult it was for you as a person who knew Bill over that period of time, but also as a filmmaker who feels a responsibility to that person and knows what they're bringing to your project. Um, so I think that, you know, that, we can say it about chocolate cake. We can say it about King Crimson's music. We can also say it about the film. And I think that is one of the things that really makes it stand out is how you are able to communicate that to an audience um, without it feeling like it's all about, it's not all about you, you know. Um, but in the moment, as the filmmaker, it is. And I think that's a really powerful thing, which I think more more music films should do because what you said earlier about all of the, you know, we understand when we watch it that these people are in a position where they are delivering a level of performance or, a, you know, they are fitting into a, an idea. Um, and they know that it's consciously or subconsciously. So let's talk about that. You know, let's let's make that some one of the factors of music films particularly is, OK, well, let's acknowledge that this is this is happening. And, and what does that mean? Where do we get to with that? And I think we get a long way with this. Not really a question, but I did want to I want to respond because I think that I think we should be putting the film in the same conversation that you're having, which almost is, you think, you, the way you phrase it there is it's, it's external to the film, but I think it's absolutely in in the heart of it. Well, my my primary response to that is thank you. Um, I think that's that's very perceptive and it's it's nice to hear the film described in that way. My secondary response is that as I have to say thank you again, and that thank you is directed at Ross McElwee, whose Sherman's March was, you know, just so influential mm -hmm. on my approach. And both in terms of its, you know, at the time groundbreaking um, approach to, to showing the, the nuts and bolts and the cogs of the filmmaking process and making that part of the film. And, and I think that 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 allows for a greater degree of honesty. And if I can keep my thread, I'll come back to that in, in a second. And then the other thing that's so great about that film is that it starts with an admission of vulnerability, you know, and, and that admission of vulnerability on Ross McElwee's behalf, which is I'm meant to be making this film about this thing, but I've just got fucking done. Um, you know, then then that just brings it, makes the audience on, on side with him immediately. And, and and then there's this lovely play between the two narratives. Is it about Sherman's March or is it about his search for love? Um, but um, <clears throat> to to try and return to the original thread with with regards to the yeah the process of of showing the film making process um, is that I I was really cross the other day because I was. I was doing a lot of traveling uh, to to show the film. We had a you know we had a national screening run in in the UK, and I was doing a lot of traveling, and it was really taking it out of me. Um, and then I had to you know check myself, as they say in hip hop, because I was like, mate, you know, most of your contemporaries, they may have sort of more coherent careers than you, and they make more films than you, but their films end up on television, which is great lots of people get to see them but they rarely get in cinemas and and for me whilst i you know i have all kinds of 
the frustrations that I could spend 40 minutes talking to you about, about the documentary industry and so on. I am so fucking lucky that I get to show my films in cinemas. And and whilst it is a massive pain in the ass to take, you know, three years to make a film and then another two years to promote it and so on, there's something just so, you know, it's so, it's, it's hard for me to to find a word that, that sums up this sort of sense of, of, of privilege and excitement and, and good fortune um, and rightness that, that, you know, I get to show the films in cinemas. And the reason, one of the reasons that that's so important to the process is that, you know, cinema operates as a, as a time and space machine, doesn't it? It's like you, you, can, you can put the audience in the moment that is on screen. And that's very hard to do with television, I think. Um, so, so with this film and any film I make uh, for the cinema, is that I'm not interested in. I learned that when I was making the Man Who's Mind Exploded. I always I started making that film because Draco had such an exotic biography. I was like, he has to make a brilliant film. But then when we started editing it, and I was editing that with another really talented editor, Jim Scott, we we both had the same experience that. Watching Draco make a cup of tea in his kitchen was way more exciting and much more cinematic. I mean, the middle his kitchen was amazing because it was full of you know these erotic collages and and so on. Um, that was much more exciting than actually hearing him tell a story about Salvador Dali and cutting to some archive or some animation or something. That like you know seeing the person doing something right then and there on screen cinematically it's such a more exciting experience as long as you you can keep the audience in in that moment and i think for me making the filmmaking process part of the film accentuates that sense you you have the sense in the audience that this is happening right now even though you know how it got there and you know that that you're it's not even this is question of sense of suspension of disbelief you're just there yeah. So, um, so, so I think that approach contributes to that sense, and also the other thing that's great when when you sort of taught the audience the grammar of the film, which is like this camera's on all the time. You know, sometimes it's going to get in the way of people. Sometimes people are going to get annoyed with it, but it's basically on all the time. What once they're aware of that, and once you're actually doing that. The really useful thing about it, and if I was going to steal an idea from me, it would be this one, is that even if it all goes tits up, if it goes horribly, horribly wrong, you're getting great material. <laughs> um, and and because you've established that that with the audience, that you're, everything's going in, if it's useful, you've established that grammar with the audience, then you can put that stuff in. And, and so it's... You know, it's I, I've 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 ex explained in the past, or I've compared the the process of working with King Crimson, particularly Robert, you know, as to being analogous to being repeatedly kicked in the balls. Um, and there was a point where I was just like, well, I can kick back, but I'm only going to get to kick back once, and that will be the end of the film. So there's no point in doing that. So I have to find a way. Of, of taking that, but without becoming somebody's bitch, you know, yeah. effectively. And there were lots of times when I did I did feel like that, but I had to sort of keep, you know, keep keep the bigger picture in mind, sort of odd pun. But, um, and also I was aware that, like, every time I got kicked in the balls, metaphorically, I was recording that. Yeah. And I think that one of the things that the film explores is and i think this is a this is always a really interesting thing to watch is what people do with power mm. you know i think i think you can learn an all an enormous amount about somebody um if you give them power and i mean that's that's the engine of tragedy really isn't it is you know that's that's how people go on to commit hubris um so but but yeah so for me it's really important to make documentary cinema and it's important to 
that you've just, sorry, it's important to me to make documentary cinema. And the reason it's important and the reason it works is because you want to keep the sense of being in the moment. And coincidentally, that's one of the things that the film's about, you know, yeah. being yeah. present, be present, pay attention. Um, so it, it sort of, it works very nicely that the other thing about that particular style of first person filmmaking, um, is that I play a lot of video games and I play a lot of pers first person shoot 'em ups. And if you've played Doom or Fallout or Skyrim or any of those films or those, those, those games, you will recognize the dynamic. And I wasn't aware of this until one day I was watching the film and I was like, oh, fuck. You know, it's Doom. <laughs> and the Court of the Crimson King is basically Doom. <laughs> is that you're just going round, round and round all of these corridors. You're meeting various challenges going on these quests. Amazing. Until eventually you have the confrontation with the big boss. Amazing. I love that. Um I would not have I would not have put those two things together. So that's 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 amazing. Um what you were saying there I did I mean that's that's the great thing about the creative process is that is that like you know I don't I'm not interested I mean I like I like to reverse engineer from a feeling for the audience at the end of it or a conversation. But other than that, I don't really have any plan. And any time I come up with a clever plan, it always fucks up. Um, but but the, the exciting thing is what you learn along the way. You know, and that's also one of the reasons why I didn't try to fill my head with too much research. It might have been annoying for people. It might have seemed a bit disrespectful on occasions where I was like, I don't know that. Um, but I think that sort of being in a position of Active in ignorance is is quite good for a filmmaker. Yeah, nice place to end uh, ignorance. Um, um, it <laughs> what reminds me. <laughs> um, it just, what you were saying there reminded me of a lovely quote I like, um, which uh, Kent Jones writing about Goddard when he died was sort of quoted Wallace Stevens, who said the poetry is the subject of the poem, from the poem issues and to this returns. And he says, and so it is with cinema and all the other arts whose point of origin and ultimate destination is always themselves. Um, and I think that, you know, your filmmaking is so well attuned to the subject um, that it just makes for us a, a really wonderful experience and an absolutely, yeah, it's a fantastic film. And uh, I am glad that you made it, even if at the moment, you know, it doesn't necessarily feel like you are today. <laughs> I'm also glad that I I made it, and it's sort of, um, you know, it's also important to to stress that maddening though it is to be in the court of the Crimson King, there is no other organisation in the world that would have let me make the film in the way that I did make the film, hmm. and that they didn't interfere in the process at all. There's been some muttering and complaining about various elements of it, but there's been no creative interference whatsoever and it's a completely independent production mm -hmm. um but as as this is a filmmaking podcast uh, without the slightest trace of bitterness in my voice i do want to point out the lack of support for truly independent cinema in the uk is is quite staggering and quite frustrating um and it's 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 interesting to see that if you are truly independent, that means being truly independent. Yeah, um, we hear you. We hear you, and, and we and we're always trying to. Yeah, we're always trying to. That's why this podcast exists a lot of the time is to to try and help in some way to shed light on on those challenges, but also on the amazing work that comes out of that adversity, that kind of industrial adversity. Um, so yeah. I appreciate I appreciate yeah. you taking the time today to talk to me as always. Oh, it's been an absolute pleasure. Been it's been such interesting questions and and it's it's just nice to have a sort of a conversation and 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 not be asked, you know, whether King Crimson are going to get back together or whether Adrian's going to get back in the band. <laughs> so thank you very much for having me. Always a pleasure. <laughs>